Hello and welcome to Colonial Outcast, the anti-imperialist podcast that will make your uncle increasingly uncomfortable, then confused, then immensely pissed, because anger is generally a secondary emotion that covers up something else that we'd rather not be feeling. And look, there's a lot of anger coming from Democrats, having your worldview <coughs> challenged in ways uh, or sorry, challenged is always difficult. And they thought they had the presidential election last week in the bag after running the most out of touch campaign that I can remember. But don't expect a lot of introspection about that from the elite coastal DNC donor class. The Dems lost the election to the overtly fascist orange blob because you, the voters, failed them. They didn't fail you because as we all know, the ruling class is infallible. So anyways, I'm your host, Greg Stoker, and we are joined today by regular contributor Alina Xenophantos, geopolitical analyst coming to us from the island of Cyprus, a.k.a. the island of cats, a.k.a. the U.S.-U.K. imperial aircraft carrier in the eastern Mediterranean. Thanks so much for coming on, as always. Oh, yeah. Thank you for having me. And I love the little introduction to Cyprus for those who might not know. <laughs> lots of cats, lots of uh, NATO bases and activity. So basically, yes. Are you as excited as I am for the next four years? And by excited, I mean like the, the opposite of that. You know, honestly, I'm just kind of unshaken by it all. I mean, I'm not excited uh, but we are living historically progressive times because rapid change is coming and that can go either way. The power, however, lies in our hands. That's what I will say for now. And we are truly in uncharted territory. Just watching the Trump cabinet nominations is pretty wild. And this story broke last night and uh, Fortune magazine reporting Pentagon stunned by Trump nomination of Fox News host as defense secretary. So President-elect Donald Trump <clears throat> stunned the Pentagon and the broader defense world by nominating Fox News host Peter Hesgeth or Hegseth. Sorry, I'm still getting used to this guy's Hegseth. name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Peter Hegseth to serve as his defense secretary, tapping someone largely inexperienced and untested on the global stage to take over the world's largest and most powerful military. A Fox News commentator and veteran who has expressed disdain for so-called woke policies of Pentagon leaders, opposed women in combat roles, and even questioned whether the top American general was in his position because of his skin color. It is... <laughs> Sorry, I just... Look, Idiocracy was one hell of a documentary. All right. So if, <laughs> if, if confirmed by the U.S. Senate, Hegseth could make good on Trump's campaign promises to rid the U.S. military of generals who he accuses of pursuing progressive policies on diversity in the ranks that conservatives have rallied against. You know, it could also set up a collision course between Hegseth and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, Air Force General C.Q. Brown, a former fighter pilot who, whose command experience in the Pacific and the Middle East, who Hegseth accused of pursuing the radical positions of left wing politicians, which is absurd. Um, and, you know, all that sounds bad. But I would like you guys to just take this moment to either watch if you're on this, the, uh, the video platform or listen if you're on the audio platforms to just how bad this is going to get. This is, this is your SecDef nominee, everybody, posting on social media on the 4th of July. Independence Day is almost here. We're getting ready in the Hegseth household. We celebrate America, old glory, and the freedoms our forefathers fought to establish. And if you're just listening, this guy's wearing Viper sunglasses. He's got a camo hat with an American flag on it, and he's in some sort of bro tank top. And it looks like he's been tanning. Freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, the right to bear arms, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You know the thing, as Joe likes to say. We also know we're one nation under God. There are a lot of folks trying to divide us right now. So religious freedom, but one nation under God. There's a lot of folks trying to divide us right now. Dude, that's literally you. Now, but we know who we are. We love God, our families, and our republic. Your support of veteran-owned, American-made, anti-woke companies like Palmetto State Armory, Caliber Coffee, Right to Bear Self-Defense, 
and AAC ammunition keeps us strong at home. We vote with our feet and our dollars to stay free. Voting with our dollars. Uh, I guess he's talking about lobbyists or something. Okay. Well, yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. To that end, AAC just rolled out a new line of AK-47 ammo. That's <laughs> Okay, so he's holding up this ammo box that he's trying to sell on the 4th of July. Uh, this is our SecDef nominee. Um, anyways, the logo for this like saber ammunition has two palm trees and two cross sabers. So that looks really Saudi to me. Just an observation. I love how he's running an ad. I love how he's running an ad quite literally though. That's right. Moving because on. Russian ammo is now banned. So now you can buy American made 762. That's what I'm talking about. Check the text below for more info. Happy independence day, everybody from our family to yours. God bless America. Yo. Oh, wow. The chauvinism is great. Uh, yeah, it's also yeah, the, the chauvinism. Um, yeah, look, Russian ammo is now banned. Hell yeah, brother! Keep yeah. holding the line. <laughs> I mean, quite. It's just yeah, it's rather entertaining. At least that much you could just have a good little chuckle and then dread what's to come. But you have look, a good laugh in the process. I think this is part of uh, Trump's master stroke of destroying or de no deterring China. Like, China's not going to want to mm -hmm. mess with that guy, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 100%, I'm so, sure. In, in looking at um, all, all of these other cabinet positions, uh, Trump has also nominated Mike Huckabee, former Republican evangelical Zionist, governor of Arkansas, as the ambassador to Israel. And he says a bunch of, like, flagrant things that we're about to listen to real quick. But in terms of policy, it's not really going to change anything. And I'm speaking only as a person. Uh, I think uh, Israel would only be acting on the property it already owns. I think Israel uh, has title deed to Judea and Samaria. Uh, this was a, from a 2017 visit to Israel. Uh, there are certain words I refuse to use. Uh, there is no such thing as a West Bank. It's Judea and Samaria. There's no such thing as a settlement. Their communities, their neighborhoods, their cities. Uh, there's no such thing as an occupation. OK, uh, you know, all the Democrats are saying, you know, everything's going to get so much worse for Palestine under Trump. And this was a huge talking point when lambasting the left uh, going up to voting. But how? Like literally that just because he says it outright, whereas the Democratic leaders who are currently in charge overseeing the genocide, um, it doesn't change policy. It's literally the same policy. I mean, they quite literally have taken place in assisting Israel, uh, ethnically cleansing Gaza, uh, trying to establish settlements. They haven't even done anything with regards to trying to deter that particular policy. And the fact of the matter is, look at the crimes that are also taking place in the West Bank and even under the Biden administration. I mean, when Trump basically recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, it was like a huge, uh, you know, uh, sort of political outrage. But then the Democrats didn't really do anything to alter that and have actually uh, pretty much given Israel the ammo it needs to just finish off the job in both the West Bank and Gaza. So, I mean, it's just they are a bit more, they have the political etiquette that the Republicans in this current form does not have. That's pretty much the only difference. I think that, I think, especially in terms of foreign policy, that's, that's a really great way to put it. They have the political etiquette that the Republicans don't. Um, mm -hmm. Their foreign policy looks pretty much identical. I don't think that Trump is actually going to really push to end the war in Ukraine. I don't think like he's got That's a lot not of, even plausible. It's not I even mean, did plausible. You, did, you see his, yeah. did you see his plan? I don't want to go off of it, but did you see the plan um, that he was proposing? Basically, he's going to uh, promote, propose to Russia to have like a 20-year uh, frozen conflict where mm -hmm. NATO troops are going to be based on the border. Why? I mean, why would why would Russia even accept that to begin with? That's NATO, I and mean, you're just basically delaying the inevitable. That okay, well, Ukraine's going to become part of NATO, and you're militarizing Ukraine with NATO troops. Yeah, that's not going to work. I mean, look, I think like defense contractors and construction contractors, American contractors, would make a lot of money off a twenty year frozen conflict. So oh, there's yeah. that. 
you know. Um, oh, yeah, they will. But Russia won't accept that. And then the thing is, Trump keeps going around saying, oh, I'm just going to make a quick phone call to Putin and you're going to see. You know, I mean, this, this is sort of like very machismo attitude that he puts forward. Like, we're, you know, it's going to end no more money to Ukraine. But the reality of the situation, Russia won't accept that. The situation will continue. He's going to fail to deliver on that front. And he's going to probably end up taking a very similar route to the Democrats by the end of it, because that's the factual sort of course of events that looks like are going to happen. Yeah. And so today we're we're going to talk about how foreign policy is, is going to be just as antagonistic towards what uh, a lot of uh, American politicians see as a near peer competitor in China. Uh, they're going to continue to try and isolate <laughs> Russia um, and like combat Iran. BRICS. Yeah. Uh, Iran, uh, according to Harris, which is our greatest adversary, which is a completely bizarre statement. But it, there will be some differences in domestic policy, and we're gonna we're gonna focus on that for a lot of this episode. So, first of all, I'd like to say, look, y'all, this Democratic Party was never gonna be able to save us from this madness, which is actually just the same madness in a lot of respects, at least in terms of foreign policy, uh, just without the political etiquette. Uh, the Democratic Party's collapse is manifest and. I would say undeniable and validates left wing critiques of its rightward drift, identity politics and lack of an egalitarian and progressive economic agenda. While this may be validating for uh, like dirty leftists who were criticized, lampooned and defamed by the Democratic Party elites for a uh, warning about this collapse for like years now, the decades long failure of the democratic party to become a bastion of the working class and working class in a universal and pluralistic sense, not in the white supremacist coded way in which MAGA officials talk about the working class uh, has paved the way for a full on fascist and ultimately self-destructive takeover of the United States. And predictably self-identifying <laughs> liberal elites are now raising their voices to cast blame on everyone but themselves voices that were previously silent about the genocide in Palestine, the betrayals of progressive climate and immigration policies by the Biden administration, the Obama and Clinton administration, and the suppression of stop cop city and environmental activists in Atlanta. And while they decry the downfall of democracy, it's unlikely that they will learn from their mistakes and will be sublimated into a junior partner in an overridingly fascist system rather than alter course and become a truly radical party. And, you, you know, I, I think that was the basic premise. It's like like when, when trying to look at, like, what are the consequences of a Trump administration versus um, a, a Democrat administration? Yeah. So, I mean, this is the thing with the Democratic Party as a whole. Um, it was never really meant to counter provide any sort of alternative to begin with. So the Democratic Party is a liberal sort of social democratic party. And this matters because historically, social democratic parties have always been established to protect the interest of liberal capitalism or capitalism in its basic form. Um, the fact of the matter is, um, even one classic example of this as well is obviously the Social Democratic Party of the United States that also has major influence on the Democratic Party, um, who have been vehement for example, anti-communists and anti-leftists. And the job of social democracy in, in, in its most, I guess, I guess if I was to get as rudimentary as possible about it, is essentially to provide some sort of welfare policies Right, which are only possible through the establishment of imperialism, by the way. So by establishing welfare policies in order to pacify the working class, particularly in the imperial core, so a country like the United States, so as to subdue any sort of uh, revolutionary tendencies. That's essentially what the Democratic Party is. It's not there to actually be left-leaning or to actually advocate for the working class, but actually to protect the interests of the ruling class by providing these sort of um, temporary fixes in the forms of, you know, uh, uh, providing some uh, rights and protections for the working class for its period of time, so long as they're able to, so that then the working class doesn't retaliate. But like I said, and we can get into this, one of the reasons that was even possible in the United States for a short period of time uh, was fundamentally because there was huge economic disparities between the US and the rest of the world. They were able to export that poverty to the rest of the world and then maximize profits, which they can then bring that money back into the United States and provide a relatively higher standard of living and some welfare policies for a temporary period of time. However, for the United States or for the working class in the United States to even enjoy that relative economic growth and progress, it was 
was off of the backs of the global south. And that wasn't sustainable in the long run. And now what we're seeing is that that's sort of essentially breaking down the welfare state or any sort of, they don't really have a welfare state, but any sort of welfare policies that even the Democrats could have implemented to prevent, for example, their complete sort of, uh, I guess, demise, they couldn't really do because, well, imperialism and sustaining capitalism is the most prevalent. So yeah. their ability to prettify capitalism can no longer work. And you're seeing an eradication of the labor aristocratic class now in the U.S. Yeah. And so, look, this is one thing that you will never hear discussed by DNC uh, allied analysts. It, we, it, it's that we have to talk about capitalism because liberals refuse to even cor incorporate it, even in a milk milquetoast. <laughs> center left democratic socialist analysis of capitalism which is personally too weak tea for me politically but it, it, this is why all of their takes are about how trump got elected are so wildly off base yeah obviously this is a uh massive problem of racism in this country and misogyny and patriarchal and white supremacist power structures within like all of our institutions but you know, you can't not talk about class and capitalism in your campaign as well. The, this, the self-described liberal has no idea about what liberalism actually is. They connect the term with human rights and equity and progress, but no, um, it's also about capital accumulation, and that is obviously the god of liberalism. Uh, it and it inevitably collapses into well, what we would call fascism and what people on the right would call tyranny, but they don't necessarily have the tools to examine that um, yet. So to talk about social democracy, uh, um, before we get into this idea of social democracy uh, 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 as pacification, this is, this is the, uh, the idealistic rendering of what it is. So bear with me a second and then we can kind of like debunk this and talk about it as actually a system of pacification and illusion and maybe a little bit of gaslighting. So social democracy <laughs> maintains a commitment to representative and participatory democracy. Common aims include curbing inequality, eliminating the oppression of underprivileged groups, eradicating poverty, and upholding use of, uh, universally accessible public services such as child care, education, <laughs> elderly care, health care, workers comp. Economically, it supports income redistribution and regulation and re regulating the economy in the public interest. Look, there's one thing I know about capitalism, though. It's that, you know, regulation totally works over an extended period of time. That was sarcasm. Anyways, the history of social democracy stretches back to the 19th century labor movement, originally a catch-all term for socialists of varying tendencies after the Russian Revolution. It came to refer refer to a reformist socialist movement that is opposed to what they perceived as the authoritarian and centralized so Soviet model of socialism. <clears throat> so, as Alina mentioned, the uh uh, SD USA, the Social Democrats uh, USA, w which is an organization established in 1972 as the successor of the Socialist Party of America, was fiercely anti-communist, pursued a strategy of political realignment intended to organize labor unions, civil rights organizations, and other constituencies into a coalition that would transform the Democratic Party into a social Democratic Party. So this is the idea that they would, you know, bring more progressive politics into the Democratic Party to try to push it to the left, you know, instead of the Democratic Party having going right every term again and again and again. This is the idea of trying to change the Democratic Party from the inside. Now, um, SDUSA's politics were criticized by former SPA chairman Michael Harrington. He's actually kind of an interesting political scientist, uh, political analyst, who in 1972 announced that he favored an immediate pullout of the American forces from Vietnam. And he's also the guy who coined the term neoconservative. After losing all vo votes at the 1972 convention that changed the SPA to the SDUSA, Harrington resigned to form the Democratic Socialist Organizing Committee, which became the Democratic Socialists of America. Um, I do have a lot of like contacts within that organization. I think it's a good gateway um, for uh, you know getting into more uh, radical politics. But uh, yeah, I don't have a problem with their platform at all. I just I just 
I have issue with the idea of change, like being able to ever effectively change the Democratic Party from the inside. Reformism and, just doesn't work. Reform, Reformism no. just doesn't work. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it it doesn't because there is there is this idea that you know politics uh, the, of gradual incremental change. You know, how's that how's that working out for y'all? Just ask exactly. I'm I mean, the fact of the matter, especially for me as somebody who's come from a legal background, I mean, the very establishment, the legal institutions, the political institutions have been formulated. I mean, they're part of the superstructures in order to sustain the base. And they're made in such intricate ways so as to prevent any sort of actual change. Not to mention the fact that ultimately, at the end of the day, when you're living in an oligarchy, because I mean, at this point, the United States is an oligarchy with a particular, you know, billionaire, if not more ruling class, who are essentially the ones that hold all power and therefore compromise any sort of uh, systemic sort of change because they're the ones that have essentially hold the money and therefore hold the power to control the regulations, what sort of regulations are acceptable, et cetera. I mean, that's why we have things like, you know, uh, lobbying, which is just legalized bribery and why we have issues like the revolving doors and how um, this entire system works anyway. It's premised on preservation of class control. This is essentially what it is. So to try to reform within a structure that in of itself is made to serve a particular class, it's not going to work. And I think ultimately, um, this is one of the biggest issues when we're speaking about, you know, taking reformism as a way to seek change. It just simply doesn't work. And social Democrats overall, what they tend to try to do is essentially sort of save capitalism by giving it that a sort of a different aesthetic appeal. But unless you discuss the root of the problem, and that is capitalism itself, which doesn't work because its economic premise is rooted fundamentally in a constant profit maximization that will always diminish, as we know, like, again, we've had this conversation a lot, like several months ago now about the tendency of the rate of profit to fall within capitalism. That will inevitably happen. And so in order to in order to sort of uh, deter that from happening, you have something called counter tendencies. And one of those counter tendencies, for example, is essentially like how imperialism was born. So, um, yes, it, it, imperialism is then created to sort of, like I said, export poverty elsewhere and then sort of bring that sort of financial wealth back to the U.S. to sort of temporarily provide the population of the imperial core some sort of relief. But ultimately, even that will fail. And if you don't start having the real conversations with regards to capitalism as a fundamental problem and just instead choose to focus on identity politics alone and the sort of human rights, because you mentioned human rights, I mean, you can't achieve human rights, like political rights or civil rights without first providing a platform for people to have those economic rights that will allow them the space to have access to these other opportunities and like it's even prevailed like even in the united states just the last point the united states is actually the only country alongside saudi arabia in the world who refused to even ratify uh the united nations sort of declaration of economic political and cultural rights because they don't believe in economic rights as being fundamental to human rights which is completely counterintuitive right you know and i would say all of this, it, here's here's another way to conceptualize this. Uh, it, it's with the overriding uh, political and moral philosophy of like liberalism, which people generally associate um, with left wing politics. But uh, uh, like we, uh -uh, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people are just coming on board, and we're like trying to get educated on this. Um, so liberalism, just because it has lib attached to it, uh, like freedom, uh, liber, I, I think that's what it, the, the root word mm -hmm. doesn't, doesn't mean that it's like left wing, uh, communal, like government for all. So it's the a political and moral philosophy, liberalism based on the rights of the individual liberty consents of the governed, uh, you know, but also, you know, which, which all sounds really good. I think every government till institution should be based on consent, whether that looks democratic or otherwise. Um, however, there are, it's inherently right wing because these principles are generally mobilized to support private property, free market economic, economic model. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. um, individual rights. Um you know, secularism, rule of law, and rule of law sounds great until you like weaponize the uh, the police state in order to protect market economics, you know, and stuff like exactly. that. So, so it's a right wing po uh, moral and political philosophy. And, you know, the problem with liberals 
is they try to hold two commitments at once. You know, on one hand, they are firmly committed to capitalism. And on the other, they express support for principles like human rights, democracy, equality, freedom of speech, the environment, the rule of law. Of course, free market economics ain't great for the environment or the rule of law, because like this is where we have uh, where we come into imperialism and colonialism, which is a higher manifestation of that, where, you know, certain human rights are se selective. War crimes that Putin's doing in Ukraine, bad. But Israel has a right to defend itself. And this is all, you know, meant and mobilized <laughs> and selective in order to justify interventionalism around the globe, which is imperial in nature. But there is a problem because, you know, this inherent duality is the core of liberalism. You know, human rights, uh, rights of people, you know, uh, egalitarianism but it can't exist under imperialism and capitalism but capital accumulation and here's a real problem requires cheapening labor and nature and this eventually comes into direct conflict with principles as we said and you mentioned like rights and equality and whatever wherever whenever sorry this conflict appears the liberal ruling class dnc donor class for us uh <laughs> sides with capital abandons their lofty principles and throws workers and nature under the bus every single time. This is why the Democrats Harris campaign was so wildly out of touch with so many voters. And that's why they got the floor wiped with them. Um, and at most they try to negotiate, as you have mentioned, mediocre compromises, you know, but they have better political etiquette than the Republicans. Um, a, a few social policies here and there, some abortion rights, which they will never codify uh, because it's how they raise funds, uh, a tiny increase to minimum wage, maybe, uh, but nothing that might pose any serious risk to capital accumulation. And this is why no one trusts liberal politicians, because deep down, they, you know, they're completely untrustworthy. They will they come off as they're capitalists yeah yeah they're capitalists that's what it is yeah so they will always preserve the interest of the ruling class and how they can sustain a system that is inherently uh generates racism it generates sexism that's the thing they'll use all these great speaking points about how they uh you know are protective of women's rights and they're you know they're the, they're the class that are concerned with the ethnic minorities etc these are nothing more than speaking points because ultimately when what what matters to the average working class american irrespective of gender or race is their access and ability to improve their material conditions that for the most part are being completely obliterated by the policies of, I guess, the ruling class in the United States that would much rather spend billions on foreign policy, on, on basically war and destruction abroad to preserve their imperialist interests than actually bring that money back into the U.S. because Lord forbid that impede on their profit maximization policies. And this is the thing. One of the biggest problems that liberals have in the U.S. is that they don't really understand, like you said, what what liberalism even is and liberalism is capitalism it's just that simple it's free market policies and that is it everything private else with property. regards like this yeah private property the ownership of private property the elimination of states or basically no state intervention and so to allow the markets essentially to govern themselves this is what liberalism is everything else that people perceive as liberalism which is the freedoms of expression etc are all basically fundamentally there just to est establish a means by which to um i guess continue uh and and facilitate uh capitalism that's what it is but it's been masqueraded in such a way uh like the language like oh because it's freedom that people genuinely think that this is some sort of good without realizing that actually it's completely antithetical and this is sort of i guess um like i like to always say i guess liberalism or liberal politics is sort of like control via consent which is sort of like antonio gramsci's uh cultural hegemony theory which i would advise people to study it's what it is it 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 in it creates the way that identity politics is played in the US by the Demo like the, the Democratic Party and the way liberal politics is sort of uh promoted, it, it's done in such a way so as to deceive the masses into believing that it's there to aid them, help them, provide them with liberties, but at the most aesthetic level. So then in actuality they concede to a structure and a system that only serves one group of people, and that is the ruling class while simultaneously turning people against each other and then dumping the burden of blame on other factions of society as opposed to the root cause of the problem. So it does multiple things. 
Yeah, you know, I, I made a comment on uh, this uh, this woman's TikTok video uh, where after oh. um, Harris lost, uh, she was like, "I'm no longer boycotting Starbucks." You know, you know, watch watch them turn Ga uh, Gaza into a parking lot. I'm getting myself a pumpkin spice latte, and I just and I just commented, uh, I just said in the comments, oh. "CIA doing victory laps right now." <laughs> oh my god. Uh, I mean, it just goes to show that their principles. Well, it, it's not only their principles. They don't know anything. It's like, I'm going back to Starbucks because the third party who was anti-genocide lost to the vote. First of all, that's not reflected in the data at all. Second of mm -hmm. all, the boycott for Starbucks originally started because they're anti-worker and anti-union. They literally mm -hmm. are union busters. Mm -hmm. So good I job think. falling back into capitalism to do a, to get your revenge frappuccinos. Also, Starbucks, guess what? Donated to the Trump campaign. So good job, <laughs> I guess. But look, 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 look. It's just... I do realize they donated to the Trump campaign. That makes it all the more ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. So look, the bottom line, the center cannot hold. And the Democrats, a lot of Democratic voters see themselves as centrists. The center cannot hold. And, you know, liberalism will always collapse inevitably. <clears throat> as for the reasons we discussed handing power to fascists, which is exactly what happened. And you, I mean, a lot of people who watch this and listen to this podcast would argue that, you know, the Democrats are that as well, just polite ones. Uh, yeah. I was about to say, it's like liberals for me are covert fascists. Like the only difference between I've, I've even said that about the politics here in Europe. I mean, quite truthfully, like just a small little point, because things that are, I mean, things are escalating more severely here. I, not here. Like I'm not, but like in, in Europe, uh, for example, Germany now that are having snap elections, the whole reason they're having snap elections is a very strategic tactical retreat on behalf of the SDP in or like the ruling coalition in Germany, because essentially, I mean, the SDP, again, Social Democrats. And in 1918, they were the ones that essentially slaughtered all the communists and all the leftists in Germany, which essentially paved the way for fascist Germany to rise, um, even killing people like Rosa Luxemburg, effectively. Um, the SDP, who's the ruling power today, they 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 essentially fired the their uh, I think their finance minister for the purpose of having snap elections. Why? Because there's been an erosion of the industrial uh, of, of like there's been a deindustrialization in Germany, which is seeing a radical sort of uh, proletarization of the working class in Germany. We're seeing a rise now in the a, a demise essentially in, in the centrist parties. Like there's no like. The, the German population are no longer supporting the centrist parties, which are like the liberal parties, and they're going towards either the far left, like the BSW, uh, or the AFD, which are the far right. And the, uh, it's, they're gravitating more to the far right than the far left. But that's like even another classic example of where we're seeing, uh, you know, the center, even in Europe, like a lot of the center traditional parties, they're no longer getting the support uh, that they once had because they're people are seeing their material conditions deteriorate as a result of imperialism. And these parties like the Democratic the Democrats in the US are no longer legitimate. But there was really no difference between the SDP, for example, historically, or even the AFD. It's just that one likes to portray itself in a certain way. They're just covert fascists. I'm just saying it like that. Simple as I could say it. Yeah. I mean, that, look, I just listened to that and it seems pretty simple to me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So, um, no, you, you should guys should definitely look in, into um, what's going on in German politics right now, because they're a heavily influential country in Europe. And just like Trump being empowered, uh, they will embolden other right wing parties within the European continent as well. So it's something to keep an eye on. But there is only one way to, like, overcome this impasse, and that is to, like, actually mobilize a socialist alternative, a political <coughs> movement that can unite the working classes, classes, OK, because we're, you know. Uh, I like to pluralize it because, again, when we hear American politicians talk about the working class, they're only talking about white people. Um, so overcome and, and also the idea of like in terms of rooting out language that's problematic, like rooting out like lower class and middle class is something we should get rid of as well, because it kind yes. of like divides the proletariat. So working classes is mm -hmm. the, the way to go. Uh, overcome capitalism deliver a real economic democracy and enable us to achieve rapid progress towards social and ecological goals. Well, you're never going to get that from a, from a, a democratic socialist perspective, c c trying to change the democratic party from the inside, as we've been arguing for the past 30 minutes 
ain't, ain't it. It's not going to, they won't save you. And I think the reason a week later, uh, continuing to at least re-examine the Harris campaign, it's, it's a great case study because it became clear that the uh, Harris would de-emphasize Biden's attacks on big companies. And they weren't really attacks um, in favor of a more conciliatory, conciliatory approach that she had hoped would appeal to moderates, the kind of like the non-existent center right, uh, you know, uh, Republican mm -hmm. voter, uh, which they appealed to instead of blue collar uh, Democratic voters. But uh, she wanted corporate leaders in her camp uh, a, as she tried to outrun the progressive reputation she had gained during the 2020 presidential primary race and blunt Mr. Mr. Donald Trump's attacks that she was a, quote, communist, which is that was absurd. Hilarious. That was, uh, oh, uh, God. Uh, there's a lot of people on social media <laughs> being like, yeah, I wish she was that cool. Anyways. Uh, <laughs> All uh, right, so do I. <laughs> okay, so Charles Myers, a fundraiser for uh, uh, Vice President Harris and the chairman and founder of Signum Global Advisors. It's a massive fundraiser for the DNC. He said in during this election season, quote, we are a center-right country. One of the few things we all agree on as Americans is the American dream. And a very big part of the American dream is the, uh, is the accumulation of wealth, unquote. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is why, this is why we, we say that when you try to change the Democratic Party from the inside and take it left, it'll drag you to the right. But anyways, I, I, mean, I yeah, sorry, go ahead. And that's just that just be my, like a very small sentence. Even the even the CEO of BlackRock essentially said the same thing. He, they didn't care. BlackRock, sorry. Who who whoever comes to power in the U.S. is really relevant. Nothing changes for us. I mean, that tells you all you need to know. We have these huge multinational corporations, CEOs saying we don't really care too much. Nothing's going to change for us. You have to understand the political system is completely compromised. I mean, it's only there so that people can believe they have they're choosing the suffering that they're living under. That's basically it. And then dump and then the political class, much like the Harris campaign, dumps the burden of responsibility on to the voter base and it and without having to actually tackle the root cause of the problem. Yeah. And I think we've made our made our case about that, you know inside liberalism is fascism and that's coming either way the democratic party and the top one percent which both parties serve will not save you so speaking of both parties then let's and the democrats inability to resist the party of trump um you know let's let's start talking about that so I kind of outlined in a previous episode on my mint press show like seven definable policy positions uh that he's talked about consistently of course we have to take everything he says with a massive not grain of salt but an entire salt shaker because he just says shit uh but <laughs> let's let's look at one of them you know the 88 billion dollar migrant deportation plan so he put uh a lot of people are freaking out because he wants he's nominating tom Haman, this friggin ogre as the borders are for this plan I, I don't use the term raids, but you're probably talking about worksite enforcement operations, uh, which this administration pretty much stopped. Workplace enforcement, that's a roundup. And that's going to be necessary. Can you just limit it to criminals and national security threat, though? If I'm in charge of this, my priorities are public safety threats and national security threats first. First implies others follow, though, right? Absolutely. So game that out for me. What's the scenario? It's not okay to enter a country legally, which is a crime. That's what drives illegal immigration. Um, okay, so he, this, this is the old Republican talking point that illegal immigration happens because everybody wants to live in America, and it's not because we have systematically had coups and you know funded right wing death squads and destabilized entire regions. But yeah, mm -hmm. you know that reason. Yeah, when there's that's no consequence. Yeah, that's yep. Yeah. That's that's another aspect of the uh, the social boomerang theory. You know, mm -hmm. when um, effects of imperialism boomerang back onto the imperial core. Well, to Biden Harris yep. administration has proven this. You can get to the border, turn yourself in, get released within 24 hours. So you are carrying out a targeted enforcement operation. Grandma's in the house. She's undocumented. She get arrested, too? It depends. 
which let, let the judge decide. Is there a way to carry out mass deportation without separating families? Of course there is. Families can be deported together. Why? Okay, so yeah, this guy, this guy has vowed to run the largest deportation force in U.S. history, and has said workplace operations will resume. Okay, so yeah, look, this will have massive implications for the construction industry, uh, housing, uh, service industry, agricultural sectors. By one estimate, and I think this is coming from Bloomberg, uh, from an immigration policy, GDP could shrink by 1.1 to 1.7 trillion. Uh, but in his recent comments, Trump has also said his plan will bring more business into the country and the U.S. Need more, needs more workers to grow. I don't think they're actually going to be <laughs> able to implement this policy, but Look, the thing is, there's this idea that, you know, things are going to get so much worse because they're appointing this guy um, as the borders are. And he was already a senior official appointed by Obama within the U.S. Customs and Immigration thing. He, like he, he was part of the whole ICE deportation plan. So the, like w when trying to like differentiate between, you know, policies in the Republican party and the democratic party, it comes back to them being more politically etiquette about it because like Obama was able to pull the wool over everyone's eyes to make it think like that wasn't going on. And yeah, I, I don't and he was notorious as well for having a uh, very, quite a brutal immigration policy himself. I mean, he had basically uh, deported uh, millions uh, yeah. of uh, people as well under his, his particular presidency. And you guys, you can't talk about mass deportation without talking about Clinton, without talking about Bush and Obama. This draconian movement that we're seeing right now did not fall out of the sky, all right? Or as Harris said, uh, it, it didn't just fall out of the coconut tree. It took years and years of bipartisan, xenophobic collaboration. And, you know, Clinton and Bush set up the deportation machine and Obama used it and took it further than ever before being apathetic during those years. Y'all being apathetic during those years doesn't change the relentless terror that occurred. So where we are now is only shocking if you weren't paying attention. So Obama was a continuation was called, of the same policies. It's a continuation, yeah. a gradual continuation of the same policies. Obama was called the deporter in chief. You know, it will take an effort to undo what occurred under his presidency. Why do you think Trump is tapping someone from his administration? Nothing about any of this is surprising. OK, you know, Clinton's 1996 illegal immigration reform and immigrant responsibility act. Bush's focus on border security and Obama's record on deportations all played a role in shaping the current situation it's a complex issue with deep roots in both parties past policies and so what kind of drives me crazy is when people talk about Democrats <clears throat> republicans being like two separate parties but exactly this is what i this is why i said at the beginning we asked are you shocked or scared but well not really nothing's going to change but the only thing we're just going to see is the same continuation the same policies essentially but with less sort of political etiquette and uh because we're at the we're seeing sort of like the demise of western capitalism it's only going to escalate under trump and it, it's not going to be as i guess uh politically correct in the process that's pretty much the only difference and it also seems like uh, Trump's going to be like an accelerationist. You know, when we talk about like curbing of mm -hmm. civil rights, welfare, um, you know, the the aesthetic principles that uh, demarcate the Democrats from the Republicans, uh, women's bodily rights around uh, women's bodily autonomy. Uh, I, I would say that they're going away either way, but he's definitely an accelerant, you know, like state violence, I believe, will increase under Trump. I, I do think we have to recognize that, unless you disagree. I don't know. It's, you know what it is? It's just because we're seeing the desperation generally, even under the Democratic Party. I mean, we have seen them crack down, whether it's surveillance, you know, whether it's the policing, the way that they've even approached the protests, the pro-Palestinian protests, among many other things uh, in the last four years um, uh, following COVID. And obviously as well, their approach, uh, their very aggressive foreign policy approach, shutting down of 
of media outlets and just the overall draconian measures that the Democratic Party has taken, this is very much indicative of the fact that they are desperate. So this is the only reservation I have in the sense of I don't f believe they have they have the the luxury anymore to not crack down on dissidents, because this is the point that I was trying to make before. Ultimately, the only way to, I guess, uh, not completely derail into like fascist violent oppression is to provide some sort of social relief systems within the US, right? But to do that, you would have to effectively, because the United States is, you know, facing like a, uh, a, a, a credit crisis with its debt skyrocketing com continuously, the only way to accomplish that is to stop funding the wars and the military industrial complex and the financial institutions and it all their projects in, you know, East Asia, Western Asia and Eastern Europe. But to do that, you would have to stop doing that. So then bring some of that money back home and start at least implementing some sort of social programs in order to pacify and relax the public, which is already rather outraged by the diminishing of their sedentary material conditions. But the Democratic Party wasn't going to do that because if they do that, then that means what? Uh, you know, in Western Asia, the Axis will win or Russia will come out triumphant or China is going to continue its, like, you know, its economic growth that threatens imperialism and unipolarity, which is fundamental to preserving capitalism. So it, this is the point that this is where I feel I know I know the argument like uh, Trump could possibly escalate but i think the desperation i think is mostly where i'm coming out of the of the ruling you know bourgeois in the united states would have probably even led the democrats to similar sort of uh, policies and like i said just maybe going about it a slap a, a tad bit more diplomatically in the same way that we've seen them do this year i mean it became a bit of a joke watching um you know matt miller and uh, uh was it john kirby as well trying to i guess uh, maneuver their way around some of uh, the American foreign policy and their approach to international rule, the international rule of law, and then simultaneously how they also approach discussing internal domestic issues within the United States. It was right. It was just. Uh, it was really rather uh, embarrassing, and but shows it speaks volumes of the desperation that the Democratic Party have, has has. And just too many people now, um, especially like Gen Z and the kids, because they don't have the same prospects everyone else had. They're being more critical and trying to understand what's actually happening. And a lot of people aren't seeing a huge difference. And so when we talk about like police violence against, uh, uh, well, hang on. Well, first of all, the weaponization of state violence will not just fall on undocumented workers and left wing protesters but also the unhoused. And this is another good thing to look at when, when trying to differentiate between like Republican and Democrat policies is this. Let me share the screen real quick and I'll describe it to you if you guys are just listening. So this is from a non-profit uh, 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 Invisible People. So this was from uh, an article published August 17th, 2023. Um, and remember, Biden administration Democrats, government-sanctioned homeless encampments are an ominous solution. So, state and government-sanctioned encampments are not what the uh, the what they're being presented to the public. These so-called solutions to homelessness bear a haunting resemblance to concentration camps. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, you know, apparently they'll be filled with like, you know, they look nice, they're orderly. Uh, they've got better, some pretty good looking tents and there'll be doctors and social workers on site, but please do not fall for this. What they're describing is an open air prison camp from which the homeless people, mm -hmm. the unhoused people can't leave. While it would be difficult for the federal government to do this directly, what's truly terrifying is that Trump is basically saying the same things as Governor Newsom, the Democratic governor, in California. This isn't an idea unique to Trump or the Republicans. Democrats mm -hmm. in California have been salivating at the idea of shipping unhoused people from where we can see them into the desert for a long time. And if they don't go vo voluntarily, they can go into the prison system and work for nothing. Uh, the mm -hmm. very well-funded landlord lobby, which, you know, uh, like Trump was a big part of because for most of his uh -huh. life, he was a Democrat and a landlord. Uh, the very well-funded landlord lobby has spent a lot of money in marketing the idea that people on the streets who drowned under the pressure of high sky rents are personally flawed. 
you know, there's no community, no collectivism, just they're an individually flawed person and they deserve this. No reflection of the cruelty of our housing market is needed. So police violence against immigrants, police violence against the unhoused, and soon uh, police violence against activists. Oh, just kidding. I was at the UT uh, campus protest uh, this this past uh, summer when uh, literally cavalry trampled liberal arts majors, and that was under you know, <laughs> you know. the Democrats. So, uh, yeah, I, I think a lot of people are are, are done with the idea that um, I, I don't know. There's any real tangible difference between a lot of parties, well, or at least enough people who were just like, why would I even vote? And that's why we had an unprecedented number of people not voting. Traditional that's Democratic thing, you know, voters not voting. Well, of course, because people are becoming increasingly you know, disenfranchised from the political establishment. They understand that there are fundamental flaws within democracy or capitalist democracy that it simply just doesn't work. And it just preserves a two-party dictatorship that effectively serves the same sort of elite. I mean, you've just shown these sort of, I guess, the essentially, you know, homeless concentration camps. Um, the fact of the matter is, I mean, the United States, as well as, uh, to be honest, like even in the United Kingdom, we've seen similar sort of uh, statistics. There's been a rise in homelessness, particularly in the last three or four years especially under the Biden administration, because, for example, of uh, the way that the uh, uh, COVID pandemic was treated. Um, also, the way, you know, the sanctions on Russia, the impact that it had on the global economy, the inflation that it caused for the average working class person. The fact that in 2019, in 2019, there was a stock market crisis. And to save the stock market and essentially bail out the banks, um, it was the it was the taxpayer that essentially had to pay the price. They, I think it was... Um, I can't remember exactly the, I think it's like 4.5, was it trillion that was given or something like that to um, the four or five major financial institutions in the U.S. to bail them out for essentially, I guess, uh, you know, um, gambling on the stock market. And it was the taxpayer. And now people are homeless in the United States, living in the streets. And rather than deal with the actual problem, they're just simply saying we need to get them basically into organized concentration camps. And But you know what? That's because we are, uh, you know, a democracy that cares about our people. And we're going to give them, you know, somewhere to sleep and provide them with a bit of assistance and some food stamps every now and then because we care. If you haven't been paying attention for the past 52 minutes, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So um, I, I just we, we've looked at some uh, some of the different uh, Trump nominees. Uh, we looked at, uh, you know, walking uh, Punisher sticker on a truck. Uh, Peter Hegseth uh, or whatever the his name is. I think like I'm cognitively disassociating from that dude because it's so insane that he's about to that that guy who's selling ammunition in a tank top on the fourth of july is about to replace a former four-star general but okay um so <laughs> i mean ma you, maybe you know what i was gonna say about the trump yeah. camp uh, or like the the cabinet i will say this a lot of them are just simply reactionaries uh I, he's placed people in power who are just sort of personalities who are, yes, uh, they're, they're going to have a very overt fascist stance on a lot of aspects, but they're not really going to change too much in terms of the actual outcome of things. But it, it just speaks volume as to also the state of, I guess, U.S. politics and the way even voters sort of address these particular, I guess, issues, it's become very reactionary and it's very unorganized. I mean, people have a right to have some grievances, but at ultimately, if you're going to start reacting uh, just to antagonize without sort of having an idea as to what really is being played out, this is where it gets incredibly dangerous. And his cabinet, like that guy, Pete, I can't pronounce his surname either uh he he's a classic example of i guess the theatrical performative nature at this point of american politics but also the sense of reactionism yeah and so i i don't think he's going to be able to effectively work with the military unless they find a way to purge <laughs> the entire military and just just implant yes men generals um which of course will like lead to the decline of us military imperium like that. So, okay, yeah. cool. But um, yeah, so I don't think he's going to be an effective leader. I, I think he's going to be so ineffective that the amount of damage that he does, if, no if nominated, if 
will be limited. And then you have Mike Huckabee, the evangelical Zionist ambassador to Israel, just like every other ambassador to Israel we've ever had. So, okay, that's really not going to change too much. Change then, no. then we have the border czar under Trump, this Tom Haman guy who was essentially the same. He, he's like Obama. the establishment of border security. So what's going to change really? And then we finally have um, Marco Rubio. This is the last cabinet member nominee, sorry, excuse me, nominee that we wanted to talk about because uh, it's getting more into foreign policy under the Trump administration. It on itself to be anything but a responsible global partner. Yeah, he's a very, <laughs> if you guys haven't noticed, if you guys don't know yet, he's a very uh, anti-China war hawk. And this is a dangerous recipe for conflict. So you see this alliance of countries that are starting to line up underneath this Chinese world order. Um, it won't be identical to the Cold War, but I will just say China is a much bigger threat to America than the Soviet Union ever was to America or the world. But then not to mention we do have near peer adversaries. We didn't 25 years ago. The United States lived in a unipolar world where we were the only show in town. You know, I'm I'm always impressed when an American politician uses a word like unipolar. I'm just like, wow, okay. Didn't expect <laughs> We're just that. saying it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just putting it out there. Yeah. Now there are an, at least one unprecedented near peer adversary, the Chinese Communist Party. Today's China, governed by the Chinese Communist Party, is not playing by any rules. It's a predatory state in nature. And it actively seeks to supplant not just the United States, but a world order committed to democracy, human rights, and the dignity of all. All right. So shout out to uh, Breakthrough News, um, who we've worked with before on um, here on Colonial Outcast for uh, assembling that reel of Marco Rubio being very hawkish. His My best question- moments. Yeah, best moments, highlight reel. Uh, your thoughts on this appointment for the uh, Secretary of State? Well, the thing is, foreign policy is going to affect domestic policy. And I think this is why it's important. It will affect the American people in a very drastic way. So this is the thing. One well, first point we have to remember, again, this isn't really much going to alter in terms of, I guess, the Biden administration's policies. I think even in September, uh, there was something called China Week, where the U.S. Congress basically voted in 25 laws that were essentially anti-China laws that included tariffs, uh, sanctions, warfare on China, including also targeting uh, any other country or many other, trying to basically include other countries around the world to prevent them from actually working with China, which will have detrimental economic implications on the rest of the world and will obviously boomerang back into the United States as well. Um, I mean, this is this sort of war hawkishness towards China wasn't something that's going to just sort of it's just start again uh, taking place under the Trump administration. It began uh, pretty much actually under Obama, uh, under especially Hillary Clinton, when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State. It continued into uh, the Trump administration and then again through to the Biden administration. And we're going to see a continuation of that, which again goes to show, like I said, the continuation uh, of the bipartisan politics and the way that they approach um uh, multiple issues, whether it's be foreign policy or domestic policy. And uh, I mean, you will see, he says that China is the greatest threat to the United States. And I mean, part and parcel of what the Biden administration had done, I think, I think it was in May of this year, is to obviously uh, begin to impose 100% trade bar- um, sorry, tariffs on electric vehicles, but it was also um, 25% or 50% on batteries. I can't remember all the solar, solar panels, among other sort of green energy or orientated, I guess, um, uh, sort of imports from China, which affect which to be very clear, uh, China only makes up a small portion of the amount of, I guess, uh, um, high tech that they're, not high tech, well, this sort of g- green energy orientated tech that is imported from China. The vast majority is actually from Europe, but that's actually going to end up, these sort of policies are going to end up affecting Europe, which is already taking a huge economic hit that is then going to impact um, the United States and its in its own industries, essentially making everything far more expensive for the average consumer. It's also sort of diverging away from the so-called uh, going towards green energy and more sustainability, which, you know, like the Democratic Party was always advocating for, but clearly that's not actually the case. And, um, you know, these policies that we're we're seeing, uh, like I said, also the militarization of uh, Taiwan and trying to provoke, I guess, sort of China through Taiwan, which is another issue. 
all of this is essentially going to have severe economic implications on the United States, not to mention that all of these 25, all these 25 sort of bills and laws that were actually passed in September, these are billions worth that are being invested into anti-China projects, including one, which is like 1.6 billion is being invested on basically promoting anti-China propaganda. This could have all been used on social welfare programs by the Biden administration, but instead it was, I guess, being chosen to be used to fuel this new Cold War, as they call it, which isn't even a Cold War, it's far more of a hot war at this point, uh, against China that is going to have detrimental uh, global economic implications that will affect the working class. And ultimately, you're going to see, again, the worsening of the conditions of the working class in the United States. And so uh, you can see that, again, this is just the same sort of policies, the same underlying current uh, the perpetuation of wars, whether it be direct military warfare or economic warfare, and uh, that only serves the financial ruling class, the military industrial complex, and preservation of imperialism. And I think that people who voted for Trump are more primed than career liberals to understand that. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. we talked about them like not having like the the tools or like you know the no the requisite knowledge to understand that yet. But I think they will get really disaffected. Like one, I think the third most <laughs> like highest Google search right now is how do tariffs work? Because I think a lot of people who voted for Trump are realizing that other countries aren't paying the other companies in other countries aren't paying the tariffs. They're no, paying. yeah, they they thought they're they're going to be the ones paying the tar the tariffs. So essentially, they're the ones that are going to be the most uh, impacted. Essentially, because like I said, one of the bills in, it basically also criminalizes, I guess, uh, other countries from working or importing from China. This would include the European Union, which is deindustrializing. But they're basically waiting on the European Union to provide them with you know things like solar panels, etc. So essentially, you're criminalizing the European Union, therefore, or basically stating that you're going to what, start impo imposing tariffs um, on imports from there as well. So they, they, the way that they, and this was, again, this was under the Biden administration, uh, and it's just going to be basically worsened now. And it's going to be the American public, again, that pays the price. But people don't understand the way these things work because of the way it's being presented, because people aren't given the tools necessary to uh, be able to analyze the real economic implications of uh, American America's foreign policy on them. But like I said, America can either capitulate and realize that this is the end to the unipolar world. Um, and But if they do that, that means the uh, capitalist ruling class will have to accept that their system of being driven solely by profit maximization will also have to end. And they'll have to establish a new so social system that they don't want to do. And if the American public picks up on that, then we'll be looking at sort of actual a possible revolutionary drive but lord forbid they allow people to think in those terms yeah and you know ever since like the vietnam backlash and the civil rights movement um you know which were spread pri primarily on like college campuses there has been a massive drive across both parties uh across the uh, from the movers and shakers of both parties to have a concerted uh assault over the decades on the public school system so you know, I also just want to say, because I see a lot of Trump supporters say, you know, oh, uh, Trump actually came out and said he's going to end all the wars. He, he, this was a, he just says a lot of. No, nonsense. he's not. No, he's not. Yeah, exactly. He just says, he just says things, you know, he just whatever comes to him, he will say he's going to continue fueling Israel. He's going to. Pro I mean, he's been probably the most hostile towards Iran. I mean, after all, he was the one that killed General Soleimani. Um, he's the one that's consistently sort of targeted. He also ended the uh, nuclear deal between Iran and the United States. That's not going to terminate. It's probably going to escalate once he takes in power. Um, his proposals to Russia are, are going to fail and he's going to amp up the economic and trade wars with uh, uh, China and possibly um, continue to provoke um, via Taiwan as well. So he's not going to end war. He's probably going to escalate, much like the Democrats were going to escalate. And that's all going to impact in the, um, the working class, like I've already said. And just because we did touch on this earlier on when before we started the podcast, things as well, like when it comes to, I guess, um, even reproductive rights, et cetera, and some of the, again, the rhetoric that he's putting forward, the pharmaceutical companies, which 
are another massive industry in the United States, will not permit a lot of his proposals anyway, even when it comes to trans-related issues, because that's another money-making industry. We have to also recognize that, and we also have to always have to follow the money trial. So a lot of Trump's rhetoric is just rhetoric because he see he gets a lot of, I guess, support by people who are reacting against, I guess, uh, what they understand as being, I guess, the I guess global globalists, which most people don't understand that globalization is just another term for imperialism. But again, because people don't have that kind of knowledge, they're reacting to liberalism. And he seems to speak to that demographic by, you know, using these little catchphrases, but ultimately he really won't change much. No. And this is something we talked about during the show and in closing, like, you know, capitalist interests will protect themselves. So when he wants mm -hmm. to do things like ban contraceptives, plan B, um, you know, all these different uh, re reproductive medications, guess who's going to <laughs> mobilize against him? Like it's going out of style. Big pharma. Exactly. Yeah. Lobby with lobbying um, against political enemies um, uh, lawsuits. Also, if he wants to slash the department of education, uh, student, uh, corporations that own student debt will also mobilize against him. And those are just two examples. Okay. Um, you know, it, it's not going to, he, he's not just going to have an open hand and, and a lot of people, uh, like uh, who, who are registered Democrats are freaking out right now. Cause he thinks he's just going to be able to like slash all these things and we're going to become That's like the, the fourth Reich overnight, but that's just not how the <laughs> capitalist system, a capitalist <laughs> system works. So I, I do think that there's a lot of reactionaries on the, the Democrat side who just don't understand the entire system as well. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they can only think in terms of like race and misogyny, uh, and they never talk about uh, like the economic aspects of like capitalism or class. Yeah. If you don't understand that, then you don't even understand that um, you, you can't actually uh, have a, a correct assessment of even issues that with regards to race and gender as well, because you have to get to the basics of how the system works and how then it tries to manifest uh, all these other particular issues or how those other issues are sort of impacted by that. They balance each other out, but you need to have an accurate understanding of class and the economics of capitalism. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't because it's such a uh, it's such a dogma in the US and generally within the West to even, I mean, bring up things like Marx. Ooh, you know, people might have like a mental health crisis, like it's the boogeyman, <laughs> like quite literally. Yeah, I mean, you, you don't have to be a Marxist to still read Marx, like Engels and like Lenin and stuff. Like, you, you, there's also a lot it's of a source of information. Yeah, and there's also a lot of like really great um, anarchist texts too. Just like mm -hmm. incorporate what works for you and doesn't. Don't be scared of it. Um, mm -hmm. So, anyways, um, that's that's kind. Of, we're kind of a uh, at the end of our time. We we. It's kind of an engaging conversation, so we're going a little little later than we usually do. But yeah, basically just to to roll it up. Why did Democrats lose? Obviously, we 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 established that, or at least our argument for that. Social democracy as a form of pacification, so you never actually do anything truly revolutionary. Just keep fighting for that incremental change. That's the responsible way to do it, and it's you know you just got to change the system from the inside. A system which is inherently right wing, so you'll obviously get dragged along with it if you try to fix it. Um, and then liberalism collapses into you know different forms of like fascism. And again, like a lot of people don't connect with the term fascism right now. A lot of people on the right, uh, because you know the fascists of today don't look like Mussolini and Hitler and Franco because they don't have to anymore because there's not really a, a, a salient threat to capitalism anymore, so they don't have to be as violently. I don't know. I don't know what you think about that. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. I still I when I when I see a lot of the political class, I do see them equally as fascists and actually just uh, even more. I, I actually view them. I actually view Hitler and Mussolini as having at least a little bit more intellectual capacity when delivering something as opposed to a lot of our political class today, which looks as though they're infantilizing the entire public. It's rather it's actually rather comical we vote with our feet and with our money and check out these american-made seven seven oh, seven yeah. six two rounds no more of them russian shit boys okay yeah <laughs> so yeah and then the we wild talk, west 
Yeah. Have gun, will travel. So civil rights, welfare, <laughs> stuff like that as aesthetic principles um, that really just differentiate two, two parties that serve the same class and the same interests. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, we try to end with a call for action. Well, here's our, our little call for action. Just to start thinking about it. Why the dis I, I definitely think the disaffected voter base of former Trump voters and people who will become disaffected. Cause again, they're starting to learn about tariffs. They just don't have the tools to, to do this. Well, like yeah. I think those people will be approachable and teachable. And here's your in. Do you think Democrats are the establishment? Do you not trust them? Do you like guns? Well, guess what? You know what they say? If you go far enough left, you get your guns back. So I just, just start thinking about the idea of like, I've had personally more success in talking to former MAGA voters who now don't like Trump anymore than I do with people mm -hmm. who have been drinking the DNC Kool-Aid for over a decade. So something to think about, y'all. So uh, mm -hmm. we looked at Trump's cabinet and look, things are going to change. Things are going to get worse. But like, that's not what really moves U.S. policy. OK, mm -hmm. having a bunch of idiots in a cabinet is not going to change the overall system overnight so yeah anything you want to add in closing no i well, basically just a continuation of what you said people need to, i mean don't panic because trump came into power i guess panic because we are living in like i said very historically progressive times and as imperialism begins to see its own its demise which was inevitable it's just the way it works uh we're gonna see a lot of violence and oppression so all i would say is educate yourselves read as much as you can get organized because we will all need it. And we will be doing some ep uh, yeah. episodes in the future, very near future on what organization looks like. And I know a lot of people are wondering like, what do we do? What do we do? Trump's president. Well, we're going to, we're going to talk about mutual aid, community defense organization and education programs. So hope to see you then. Uh, we, I think this is going to be our last colonial episode, uh, outcast episode for this week. There might be another one. Um, but if not, we'll see you next week and we are on Patreon. If you want an extra episode and a live Q and a session every week. So check that out. Uh, thanks so much, Alina for coming on and we will see y'all next time. Cheers y'all. <laughs>